Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 17. Uh, we're studying the topic of heaven. And we're using this book by Randy Alcorn uh, as our guide, discussing the book. And the name of the book is Heaven. The author is Randy Alcorn. We're about halfway through the book right now. If you haven't seen the first uh, 16 episodes, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I suggest you watch them. Uh, there's Obviously, we've had 16 episodes that are two hours long each. So uh, we've already had a lot to say and you know, discuss and think about uh, heaven, and learn about heaven, and there's so much more uh, to go. So I hope you go back and watch those if you didn't see the previous episodes. But uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Brother Eric, and he's he's my uh, co-host or panelist on the show. So help uh, say hi to him. Hi everybody, Jesus Knight 72 is my YouTube channel. Um, this has been a great study. Uh, a lot of things to consider. Uh, many things that you know in my walk with the Lord that I, I haven't considered over the years. That uh, very, very interesting questions and, and very interesting, I think, answers that we come up with sometimes. Okay, brother Eric, thank you for joining me. Okay, I know your book is. Uh... The pages don't necessarily match. Uh, I'm on page 210. The title is, uh, the work starting on is Our Inheritance, mm -hmm. Owning and Ruling the Land. Um, it says, uh, when an earthly father dies, he bequeaths his estate to his offspring. His children are heirs. To what? To their father's property. If he owned land, they become landowners. If he was a king, they are heirs to his entire kingdom. When an earthly king dies, his firstborn takes his place. Sometimes the new king is surrounded by siblings who are his co-heirs and therefore co-rulers. As heirs, the king's children rule on their father's behalf, even if he still lives. Uh, they share in his glory. They go to battle to defend his kingdom, which is also their kingdom. In battle, they share in his sufferings. Well, uh, I, I, he's done this numerous times in the past, given us some kind of uh, real life, a uh, real world uh, example, as an analogy to make the point about what we can expect uh, in uh, uh, in eternity and the and the new heaven, new earth. So, uh, do you think that this uh, this kind of analogy really? Um, makes sense and fits with this? Oh, uh, absolutely. And and this is the reason why the Bible, why God's Word makes a point of telling us that when we are born, which was Jesus Christ's whole point about saying we must be born again, you know, we're, we're born into this world as children of our earthly fathers and mothers. When we're born again, we're now born again reborn spiritually as children of God. We're now, the Bible tells us, sons and daughters of God. Well, there's a reason why God tells us that. There's, you know, God gives us a little information sometimes in a short, a short uh, comment in Scripture. And by telling us mm. this, and then you look at the other the other portions of Scripture where Jesus talks about uh, the servants who have been given much to be responsible for, they'll be given more, or the story of the prodigal son and that he ha he's entitled to things, inheritance. By telling us we're children, that we're children of God, I mean, these are all things he's inadvertently telling us. This comes along with being children. It comes along with be him being our father. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the idea of... Um being co-heirs to uh, rule in a, in a kingdom, and also co-heirs in terms of we inherit uh, ownership of the property, the estate. Absolutely. Okay. And people uh, need to, now real quick, people need to keep in mind, we're not saying that we become co-heirs or, or are entitled to this. Because, again, this is where faith alone comes in. You know, we're not heirs to this and co-rulers because we deserve it. It's not by something that we've done. It's because God deemed that this was going to be the way it is. That's why we deserve it. Not because we deserve it for what we've done, but what, because of what he's done. Yes. So the, this status as a child of God, 
uh, is something that we don't deserve, but we receive this, uh, we are transformed as a, uh, a new creature, a child of God, uh, and, and because of our faith in Jesus, not because of any personal merit, only right. because of our faith in our Savior. And yet once we do that, then we, we are entitled, uh, we do have uh, merit, uh, this inheritance, because we are legitimate uh, children of God, and, and that is just the way it works. You know, you're, you inherit uh, the uh, estate of the Father. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, someone corrected me once. There's an old saying about grace that, I mean, a de definition of grace is very common, that grace is unmerited favor. Mm -hmm. I think you know that's a acceptable definition, uh, but there's a person I know that said, "Well, he didn't like that. He didn't think it was correct." He, s he says because it is merited. We 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 do deserve the favor, the salvation, because uh, because we put our faith in the Savior. So therefore, so he was really drawing a distinction there and saying we do deserve mm -hmm. it. So we do deserve it because. But not because of anything we've done, but because we trust what our Savior did. Exactly. Okay. Uh, now, and there's, he's going to cite a lot of scriptures that make this point about us inheriting this because we're uh, a child of God. Now, this may sound to a lot of people who are not that knowledgeable of scriptures to say that you, brother, you're a, a child of God. You're a son of God. Mm -hmm. uh, they they might really think that's shocking. I know I've talked to people that said. You think you think you're a saint? You think you're like a <laughs> son of God? You know they just they don't understand that that's what the scriptures say about us when we put our our faith in the Savior. That's our our state of existence. Our our, our, our standing is that uh, we are yeah. now a child of God and we are saints. Mm -hmm. uh, but if people don't really know this because they haven't studied the scriptures, they really think that this is kind of egotistical on our part to, to make that kind of claim. No, that's and that's a great point you make. It, it they don't feel that way because of an arrogance that we have for saying it, but because of a misunderstanding they have about the terms in Scripture. Um, you know, being a child of God again, we're not saying people tend to think when you say you're a saint, when you're a child of God, they already have a misinterpretation of what they think that means, or or a misunderstanding of why you think that. It's not because I earned it by doing something. It's it's you know I'm not a special person, and that's what they tend to that's what they tend to think a saint is. A saint's a saint because well, they're these people who have done amazing things in their life, and only those people get to be saints. And then people have to decide that they're saints after they're dead, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's not the way it is. God sees us as saints, and this goes along with perfection that we receive based on Christ, not us. Again, Christ makes us perfect. Not our actions, not our deeds. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we were talking before the show about the, the how people go to one extreme or another uh, on a, on a on a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. It's it's so common they cannot really see the correct viewpoint and they err right or left of it. And I think in this question is an, is another example of that problem. Some people will say, "How dare you call yourself a child of God? Uh, you know, uh, or a saint?" Uh, and then other people will say, "Well." Aren't we all children of God? Now, let me ask you, brother, uh, is every person, a human person, a child of God? Uh, no, they're not. Well, um, you, wait a second, wait a second. That's very offensive to, to the whole world <laughs> that, that thinks that, that, that we're all a child. Everyone's a child of God, and you're saying they're not? Nope. The Bible the Bible tells us specifically who a child, who a child of God is, and, and children of God are the ones who put the faith in the one whom God has sent. And they are the children of God. They are the ones who, um, who are born again. This is where the term comes from. Once again, you are literally born into a new family. You are born into God's family. And that can only come from accepting Christ and him doing for you what you cannot possibly do yourself. So uh, how would you – if I said who are the children of God, what would you say? The children of God are all those who have put their total trust and faith in Jesus Christ for their salvation. Amen. Okay, brother. That's. Uh, I hope that uh, that's an important thing. If a person learns nothing else from this uh, study today, that's that's important enough right there. Absolutely. Okay. It says it's the same in our relationship with God. Quote: The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory, unquote. That's Romans chapter 8. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Randy Alcorn, the author of this book, uh, uh, he, he'll make a statement or a, present a, a, a viewpoint, and then he'll cite scriptures to support that, and, mm -hmm. and we see him doing this through the whole book. Uh, so here in this verse in Romans, it, it, it tells us that yes, we are uh, the, the a children of God and co-heirs with Christ. Of course, the king of the universe, God, never dies. But he has delegated sovereignty to his firstborn son, Jesus. Uh, Jesus Christ, no, Christ in turn gladly shares his dominion with the redeemed, his siblings, who are co-heirs of the Father's throne. They will rule with Christ over the kingdom. We've been talking about that in the last episode, about what this means to rule with Christ. Uh, and now we're talking about inheriting land. Uh, so, um, so Christ gets the inheritance, but because we're siblings of Christ, you know, we are sharing in this inheritance. We're co-heirs. The right to exercise power comes from ownership. A king owns his kingdom, which consists of land. The extent of his rule in the extent of what he owns, God, uh, because God owns the entire universe, the kingdom that falls into the lap of his heirs, his children, encompasses the entire universe. That it all came under the curse for Adam's sin demonstrates its tie to humanity. Yes, that's a big key there. And this is where we keep drive point home to people. You know, don't just watch these videos, and you'll hear this straight from both of us. Don't just watch these videos and listen to us. Get in your scripture. Study your scripture. This is why it's so important to get in your Bible and study it. You don't know how many times that I'll, I'll talk to a Christian who's a good Christian, but they just, they'll come across a, a, a thing where they kind of, They'll hear something like this about the co-heirs with Christ, and that you know we're entitled to rule and things like that, and and they'll kind of say I, that's not right. Like you said, that that can't be right. That's a, we we don't have that. And then you'll read them Romans eight sixteen seventeen where it says specifically heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And you don't I can't tell you how many times that I've dealt with Christians that they say you know what I've never seen that before. <laughs> it's like this is where you've got to get in and you've got to study your scripture because. This is all in there, and and we constantly tell people, don't just listen to what we're saying here. Please check what we're saying. Go in the Bible. Find it for yourself. We would never suggest that you simply listen to us and just follow what we say. It's all there right there. I mean, in black and white. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so much of what we are, have been saying in this study, and uh, matter of fact, all, all the studies that we do, uh, is explicit in the Bible. It clearly says it. I, I, I explicitly in these words, declaring this truth, and and, and then much of, of what we also say is uh, is implicit, which means that it may not say it exactly in those words, but by putting two and two together and reading, we we come to certain conclusions. Now right. the implicit part, uh, we can't be as emphatic and dogmatic about because we have to use our intelligence to discern, you know, how uh, how it all fits together. And but I find that. Uh, even though I may have strong opinions on some of the things I think the Bible implies, mm -hmm. this is eisegesis and exegesis. Mm -hmm. Exegesis is what the Bible clearly states to us, mm -hmm. and then eisegesis is what we are saying we're learning from it and our interpretations of it uh, uh, that we're saying about it. Right. Uh, and, and when we're doing this, uh, saying what the Bible implies to us, uh, we shouldn't be so dogmatic about those things because we're trying, we're trying to put the pieces together and figure it out, and we may not be right all the time. Right, exactly. In this case, where we have a specific question about being co-heirs, I mean, this is this is right here. I mean, it's it's yeah. right here, very simple. It's I mean, this is it says that right there. It's speaking you know, if we share in his sufferings, of course, that doesn't mean we have to suffer just like he did. I mean, it means that by accepting his suffering on our behalf, we have shared in his sufferings. Mm -hmm. You know, we we've accepted Jesus suffering for us. Uh, you know, every stripe he took, every drop of blood that was shed. Um, you know, uh, we we have accepted this being nailed to the cross. You know, which is why the Bible says we've died with him because we've accepted his death. We've for what it is. 
Uh, I don't think Randy is going to re reference this, but, uh, but a, a verse comes to my mind in, in the uh, uh, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, it took me a long time to really, I think, understand what that means. And uh, meekness is, is the state of mind that a person has to come to in order to get saved, I think. We have to, we have to conclude that, wait a second, I'm powerless. Uh, I, I need a greater power. I need God to, to solve my problem. My problem is, uh, you know, I, uh, I need to be saved. And, mm -hmm. and I need, need to trust God, who is Jesus Christ, to do the saving. And, right. and in order to, to come to that conclusion, a person has to be meek. And when, mm -hmm. when a person does have this meekness and they come to this conclusion, then they get saved. And those, those of us who are saved, we do inherit the earth. Now, a lot of us, uh, a lot of people don't understand how uh, we are going to inherit the earth. But then he takes it a step further. Randy says, we're going to inherit the universe. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, That's I, mean, I mean, the earth is pretty fantastic to know that we're in inheriting it. But, but, he, but he makes it, he makes a very important point there when he talks about all the all the universe fell under the curse. I mean, it's all of creation. This is truly all of creation. We tend to we tend to kind of stop at the earth and think about creation that the rest of the universe is not kind of part of that. But that's all part of creation. That's all <coughs> creation. Yes, and there's a scientific uh, word or concept called entropy, mm -hmm. and that is where everything is going from order to disorder. Yes, and that, this this principle here is is one of the greatest proofs against uh, uh, Darwinian type of evolution. Mm -hmm. And that is that uh, things do not naturally go from chaos into order. That's right. Uh, they have to be they have to be order uh, put into order by uh, a designer, someone who controls and places it in order. It doesn't just happen right. randomly. Uh, the contrary is the law of entropy says that things are naturally going becoming less and less organized and becoming more chaotic. And that's what we see happening in the entire universe. And that's why Absolutely. everything is falling apart. Machinery well, falling what, apart over time. And here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. And this this is where sin and the physical world and the science of the physical world tie together. That's not only happening in a in a physical way, but it's actually happening in a spiritual way. You know, the further we go, the worse man's condition is becoming because of sin spiritually as well. It's not only the physical but spiritual, which is why eventually we're going to lead to the tribulation and the end times, the worst time in human history that's ever going to have existed. Um, because that same thing is even applying within us in our, our, our spirits and in, inside our, us because of sin. Mm -hmm. So um, Randy is saying that uh, we not only inherit the earth, but we inherit the universe. And uh, because the entire universe has uh, fallen under the curse, uh, when when the uh, uh, it's all restored, that that all of that is part of man's inheritance. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ, the firstborn, is the primary ruler, but we are called quote co, co heirs with Christ unquote. God entrusts us to rule one prime piece of territory, Earth, which He created specifically for us. God has not arbitrarily assigned us to rule the earth. It's our land, our kingdom, granted to us by our Father. It's a kingdom once lost by us to a usurping pseudo-king, Satan, but which was won back for us by the mighty valor of Christ, who shed his blood to purchase our freedom, and with it our inheritance, the earth. Yeah, that's uh, obviously, that's like uh, Christianity 101. That's the most basic idea of all of Christianity is that uh, Christ died, his blood was shed to pay for our sins, and that's what uh, uh, allows us um, to, uh, it, it's the barrier of sin separated man from God. Now that barrier is removed, so now man is free to have a relationship with God, and right. we do that by putting our faith in our Savior God Jesus. Uh, this is the drama of redemption. If we fail to understand our status as God's children and heirs and rulers of the earth, we will fail to comprehend God's redemptive work. But if we do understand our role in God's plan, we'll realize that he would not deliver us from earth to live forever in a disembodied realm. In fact, 
the inheritance that God grants us is the very same earth over which epic battles have been fought since Satan's first attack in Eden. Our inheritance is not only physical, but also eternal. Quote, the days of the blameless are known to the Lord, and the inheritance will endure forever. That's in Psalm uh, chapter 37. Uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but uh, yesterday I watched a video by a brother on YouTube uh, talking about heaven. And uh, his, his teaching on heaven was really contrary to what uh, we've been saying about it. Uh, and uh, um, even, though, even though we think that we can uh, make some strong conclusions from the scriptures, uh, I think we're not being so uh, declarative necessarily. We're, we're, uh, we're pr putting forth ideas and saying these are possibilities. Some of it is clear-cut and obvious. Some of it is, is speculative. Uh, but uh, but this brother always speaks in de declaratives and, and is, is uh, very uh, uh, like thus saith the Lord in his in, his, in the way he teaches. Uh, but he's really declaring that uh, some of the fundamental things we've been saying about heaven are, are, are wrong. That there's not going to be a new earth uh, in, in terms of it. Uh, uh, the new earth is not going to be like the old earth, but much much better as we say. Uh, but it's totally new and different. It'll be nothing like the old earth. And that uh, the uh, uh, the heaven uh, as it is right now is is some ethereal uh, realm, and, and that uh, and that somehow uh, it's, it's almost like we've discussed the term of Christoplatonism that somehow matter and the physical world is somehow evil, and therefore uh, you can't have any physicality uh, in heaven because uh, the physical realm is is evil. Uh, I, I, it's unfortunate. I, I think he's been influenced by this Christ, Christoplatonism that we discussed in earlier studies. Yeah, and Gnosticism. These are Gnostic beliefs as well. Yeah. Spir anything spiritual is good. Anything, um, you know, physical is is supposed to be regarded yeah. as bad. Yeah, and that, that um, any, nothing from this world will be retained in the future because everything from this world is horrible. And it would be his his, his uh, position. And uh, as we go through, we've, we've said this before, and as we go forward in the book, we're going to find that uh, uh, we think that uh, some of the, many of the really good things that we love in, about the earth and, and, and our world today will be retained, uh, but we won't have the curse and we won't have sin. Uh, but well, I guess we'll all find out eventually, but uh, it's interesting how some people, some people that we uh, even love and respect, uh, are strongly disagree. Um, currently on this earth, under the curse, we serve Christ and, quote, share in his sufferings, unquote. Why? Because the earth is under siege. It's being claimed by a false king, Satan, and his false uh, princes, the fallen angels. It's being claimed by human kings, rebels, who set themselves up against God and violate his standards by declaring their independence from him. Uh, those who are co-heirs with Christ engage in spiritual warfare to reclaim the hearts of mankind for God's glory. A quote, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, unquote. That's Ephesians chapter 6. After the final battle is won by Christ, we will rule the earth with him as co-heirs of his kingdom. Uh, one of the things that stood out as I read that is this idea of uh, declaring their independence from him. It says, it's been claimed by human kings, rebels, who set themselves up against God and violate his standards by declaring their independence from him. Mm -hmm. uh, I made a video about that point. Uh, I, I, let me get your reaction before I say kind of thumbnail of, of the video. Um, you know, I, I have a theory that I've uh, that I've always told some people, a um, few people, um, and, I, and I, I'm not in any way saying the Bible reveals this emphatically, but when you put the pieces of the puzzle together, you can kind of see behind the scenes and kind of see the nature of why Satan does what he does and why he did what he did. 
And I think a lot of that had to do, and this is my personal, this is my opinion, I think a lot of why Satan did what he did had a lot to do with us and the plans that God had to do with us in the future. I believe that God revealed to the angels what his plan was, that we as part of the creation were going to rule, that we were going to be the ones to come up and then rule this great creation that he had created. And Satan in his fashion, which you see he was very prideful, he uh, – believed you know when he finally did make his you know his uh, his rants it was that he was going to become as high as the as, as God he was going to be as great as the Almighty um, uh, I, I think he's always hated us because of the plans he knew God had intended for us all along mm -hmm. possibly it's because uh, he felt it was his rule to have to begin with which is why we deal with this now mm -hmm. so I mean now I can't confirm this without uh, clearly with you know I, I don't know I'm simply going by what I know of him in Scripture, what God tells me about him in Scripture, and the role that he tries to take. Everything Satan tries to do is counterfeit. And we talk a little bit about what we we're just talking about here, the, the people who want to lay false claims to things, you know, people who are not gods. They want to lay false claims. In fact, one of the things that Satan was so ready to hand out if Christ would only do what he wanted him to do is the kingdoms of the world. You know, Christ didn't deny that he could do this. He doesn't say you, you don't have the authority to do that. He doesn't deny that he had the ability to give him all, all these kingdoms if he would bow down to them. Um, so I think that's a great portion of why we deal with the things we deal with with Satan now, why he – it was important for him to get the deed if, it, if you know as it is um, and him to have this kind of control because this is what he always wanted and presented us for from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh that's an interesting point you, you're putting forth there. Obviously, uh, it's uh, it's uh, I don't know if it's intuitive or if it's just like uh, uh, as you study the scriptures, it's just something you think is a very viable possibility. Uh, one of the things that, that I think that uh, you and I and, and uh, other people on the panel uh, that we've discussed in the past, uh, these things with us in the past, that we we do not take the next step of saying here's a here's a a, a formulated an idea. Here's a here's a theory, here's a premise, and then uh, we don't take it the next step further and start presenting it as a doctrine and mm -hmm. saying, "Thus saith the Lord," or that the Lord spoke to me and told me this, and therefore this is a, a fact. Um, I think it's interesting to, to speculate on these things, and you know, I I I, I know I don't I doubt that you're the first one to actually even present such an idea. Oh, probably. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot of other people that have kind of put this. Uh, these uh, theories together of, of how this all transpired, uh, and uh, but then some of them make the mistake of forming a religion like Mormonism, and, and they, they then they start teaching all these right. theoretical things as this was revealed to them by God, and this is the right. doctrine that you have to believe. Uh, this question of independence, though, I think this is the essence of uh, uh, the problem of all of history, and that is that um, Lucifer declared independence from God. He did not want to be under God. He want, declared, I'm independent. I'm going to be my own God, my own ruler. Uh, and uh, he, and uh, some of the angels, one-third of the angels, uh, decided to also declare their independence and go with, with Lucifer. Uh, and in the garden, the same thing happened with Adam and Eve when they decided, wait a second, God told us one thing. Uh, this uh, serpent is telling us something else. We're... I think we should believe the serpent instead of God. Let's do this. And he said that we can become like God. We can become like our own God if, we, if mm -hmm. we'll do this. And there was their desire to break away and say, I want to be independent. And this, and all of man, it seems like uh, in history, it's man's nature to be independent from God and sovereign and not let God be sovereign and, and uh, be their mm -hmm. God. And what we have to do in order to restore our relationship is is um, uh, declare dependence, dependence on God, de dependence on Jesus, and that's what salvation is based upon. Saying, uh, I can't do it. I'm not able to solve this problem and uh, save myself through personal merit by being religious. I'm helpless. I need to depend on Jesus, right. and that's what believing in Jesus really is: is saying I'm going to depend on Jesus completely and and realize that. I can't do it. I need him to do it. Exactly. That's my video, basically, on uh, Declaration of Dependence is the name of the video. Uh, 
currently on this earth under the curse, we serve Christ and share in his sufferings. Why? Because the earth is under siege. It's being claimed by a false king, Satan. Oh, I've already read that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I believe so, <laughs> yes. So we're just kind of touching on that again. I thought I've heard that before. I'm like, wait a minute, yes, I've heard it before. <laughs> oh, boy. That's, uh, that's, that's not the first time I've done that. I guess it won't be the last. <laughs> okay, it says, should we want to rule? Uh, the government of the new earth won't be a democracy. It won't be majority rule. And it won't be driven by opinion polls. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> every citizen of heaven will have an appointed role, one that fulfills him or her uh, and contributes to the whole. No one will, quote, fall through the cracks in God's kingdom. No one will feel worthless or insignificant. I think this is an interesting uh, that he brought up democracy. Uh, I don't talk publicly much about my political opinions uh, because uh, I want my ministry to be uh, theological rather than political. Uh, I do have strong political opinions, though, but uh, I think it was Dr. Ruckman uh, that I've studied quite a bit of his. Uh, I've read about 40 of his books, and he, I think he's the one that, I made, that first made this point to me, and that was that all, all of the uh, forms of government of, of man are doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter. We've, no matter whether we get a, uh, uh, a dictatorship, uh, like a, a, even a benevolent dictatorship, uh, or a, a, a kingdom, or a, a, a oligarchy, where a, a small group of people have all the power and make the decisions, or we have our elected representatives, a republic, or democ democracy, where you know, just the majority makes the decision on everything. But none of these forms of government by man will ever succeed uh, because man is the one doing the governing. The only right. time the government will work is we have, a, it's a, it's a um, uh, uh, theocracy. It's a kingdom where God is the king, and that's what we're going to have in eternity. Now, now wouldn't you think we'd have learned that by now? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, you, you, seriously. I mean, I know, I know. I say that jokingly. I say that just, but at the same time, it's like seriously. You would have thought people could just taking just taking a step back, which people don't like doing to begin with. They they don't like to take a step back. Just take a take a minute and look at the big picture. Look at all through history. I mean, you know, and and, and the funny part is, no matter how bad it gets, and no how no matter how many ways we see that all these things are still corrupted, people still try to talk themselves into believing that that's going to be the case. And and it's it's it, to me it's mind boggling. It's like and and again, it's where that whole um your declaration of dependence comes from. It's it's about saying, look, God, I've seen the way the world tries to do things. We do nothing but mess it up. That's all we constantly do. No matter how hard we try, and the harder we try, it seems like the worse we do. So it's like, you know, it's that point where you come back and say, you know, maybe we're not the answer. You know, we're we're not the answer. There's another answer, and that answer is God. He is the only way. And this is what he's trying to, you know, in his, you know, this is this to me has always been part of the long suffering. You know, that we hear about of God. You know, it's like God. It's like it's like you know the saying. You know, sometimes a child has to touch something hot to learn that it's painful, and you get hurt when you do it. Well, you know, God kind of lets us learn these things and says, "Look, I'm I'm going to let this let you do this and do this to you understand that you know this is not the way it works. It will not work this way. You are doomed to fail in any of these means that you you come up with. It's it's doomed to failure, and and we just don't we refuse to learn that lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as individuals, we have to conclude that uh, we need to uh, uh, depend on God, not only for salvation, but for everything. God will provide everything for us. He right. provides the air for us to breathe. He, pro he provides the, 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 the plants or animals for us to eat. And everything is provided by God. We need to depend on Him completely as individuals, and then take a step further as communities and countries and societies. Uh, uh, the society that is a theocracy. I'm not talking about a you know Islamic uh, state because they're believing in a false god. 
all of right, them. Right, right. People are gonna right. people are gonna think you may mean something like that. That's not, of yeah. course, what you mean. I mean, yeah. it's, it's. I think it's simple to understand. You mean under God, theocracy. Yeah. And and even the people in in historically who have tried to have theocracies, uh, uh, Israel, uh, and uh, in the beginnings of the United States. Uh, uh, it, it still it cannot work even if they try to have a theocracy with with God in charge or Jesus Christ in charge it can't work until the the redemption of of, uh, of not only a man but but of the world and uh, this uh, new earth that's the only time it's going to actually work is because well everything has you to know work. you you made a very good point, and and we got to build on that. And the the good point you made was you know it it all comes backwards to start with the individual. You know, bad kings and bad rulers start with bad kingdoms. You know, it, it starts with bad with individuals at heart who are who are corrupt at heart, and that's why it has to be about your dependence on God as an individual first. And if more people and more people learn that, they become dependent on God. It branches out from there. It starts with the individuals and then works out from there. The reason we wind up with the rulers that we get who are immoral is because the people at their heart are sinful and they refuse to acknowledge us and accept Christ uh, or believe they have this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we know eventually uh, we will have the perfect government and Absolutely. Uh, our God will be the king, uh, king of kings. Absolutely. Jesus Christ. Uh, when I write and speak on this subject, people often respond, quote, but I don't want to rule. That's not my idea of heaven. <laughs> well, it is God's idea of heaven. We are part of God's family. Ruling the universe is the family business. To want no part of it is to want no part of our Father. It may sound spiritual to say, we don't, we don't care to rule. But because God's the one who wants us to rule, the spiritual response is to be interested in his plans and purposes. Yeah, I, this goes right along with other examples that we've yes. talked about already about, uh, you know, uh, how people will uh, be, act very pious. That, uh, well, I, I don't care about rewards, you know. I'd be perfectly happy living in a shack in heaven, and, and you know I don't need a mansion. Uh, oh, I don't want to rule, you know. Who, I mean, let God rule, well, but but God wants us to rule with Him. That's exactly right, and you know, you, you know, it's so funny. This isn't the first time that's happened. We go back to Peter. This happened between Peter and the Lord. The Lord was there, and He was washing the disciples' feet. And Peter, in trying to be pious. That's what he was trying to do. Yes, yeah. He says to, he says to Jesus, "You will never wash my feet, Lord." Now I'm paraphrasing clearly, but he says, "You will never wash my feet. I'll I'll never let you to wash my feet." And Jesus tells him, he says, "Well, then you have no part with me. This this is what I want I want to do. I do this of my own free will. And you have no part with me because this is what I'm meant to do. I want this is supposed to happen." And then and then Peter goes the other direction. Oh, wash all of me, Lord. <laughs> it's they, he does the same thing we were talking about earlier. He jumps from one side to the other. Oh, then wash all of me. Jesus stops him again. Says you don't need all of you doesn't need to be washed. Just the part that's dirty. You know, just the, just your feet. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, it's the same thing he did that. So people shouldn't beat themselves up about it, but understand that's kind of why the point was made there. It was a little it was a little one of those interactions between Jesus and his his followers, his disciples, you know, Peter being the one, that that shows, you know, there's this there's this thing we do where people feel they need to make overly pious statements and they think they're being better people by doing this. And what they don't realize they're doing is they're laying claim sometimes to abilities they don't have. For instance, they say, "No, you have to stop sinning. I don't sin anymore." I, you know, which is really a bad thing to say because there are a lot of th issues you've got in your life probably that you're not dealing with. That's one way of saying it, and the other way is saying is saying, you know, when God comes to us and says, "I mean, He had His whole role in the beginning was to have Adam and Eve come, and He told them, rule over all this I've given you. You know, I, I've given you all this to rule." Why? Why would it be bad for them to want to rule? Didn't God give it to them to rule? <laughs> so, no. Of course, it. Of course, it's good to want to rule. 
because that's what God wants us to do. So get out of this whole I, I gotta sound pious or I gotta I, I feel like I'm being a better person if I say these pious comments like, you know, no, I I don't want to rule or I don't I, I'm not a saint. I'm not a you know <laughs> because God tells us we are these things and we're supposed to do these things. Yes. Sometimes uh this uh, pious attitude or or humility it may, it may be real humility or maybe false humility to appear pious but but even even if it's real humility it's 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 wrong because uh, it, it's better to listen to God and 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 do what he says and accept what he says instead of say acting very being very humble and saying oh I'm not worthy to rule or I don't want to rule I, I just want to be a servant you know it's Okay, it says, um, whom will rule? Other people. Angels. If God wishes, he may create new beings for us to rule. Who will rule over us? Other people. Now, again, I, I can see how just reading that sentence there, that some people are going to be like, all taken back and saying, "How dare he speculate that <laughs> that uh, God may create new beings for us to rule?" You know how that's heresy. Uh, but he's not saying that the Bible says that, or that uh, that he's this is a, a revelation that God gave him. It's just it, is isn't it okay to just come up with theoretical ideas like that without being like condemned as. Uh, uh, because he said, hey, maybe God's not finished creating. Maybe he'll create other beings and we'll rule them. Uh, do you find any fault in that? No, it's one of those things that it, it's simply not revealed. And the Bible tells us that the things not revealed are for God. The things revealed are for us. For us to use what God tells us in Scripture or to make – I mean you could say that about any decision in your life that the Bible doesn't talk about specifically. I mean, you, you could use that as an excuse to never make a decision with anything. I mean, because, well, it's not in the Bible, so I can't make assumptions about anything. Well, I mean, that's not true. God gave us a mind, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to be able to discern these things. To, to think in that way doesn't go against God. It doesn't violate God, or it doesn't violate God's word in any way. God, in, in fact, the God's word seems to insinuate that this it is the case, that this will be the case. So to say that is not, um, you know, he, he's not he's not one of those people that's saying, and if you don't agree with me, you're not saved and you're damned to hell. <laughs> he's he's not saying that. He's simply saying, look, based on what I get from the Holy Spirit and and what I feel like I'm getting from God, this sounds to me, it seems to me, what's going to be the case based on everything I know about Him. Yeah, and it says, if God wishes, He may create new beings for us to rule. Uh, so of course. The, the way he's he's writing that, a person should not be so knee jerk that they're going to oh, all of a sudden be offended because <laughs> he's putting forth some idea that they they think is is crazy. Um, who knows? Maybe he's already created other people. Maybe there are beings in the universe, or maybe there's another other universes that he's doing. We don't know these things. The scripture doesn't speak of these things, right. and, and it's certainly not a heresy or. Um, you right. know, uh, uh, blasphemy to even discuss these these possibilities. Right. right. Now, can, can I be dogmatic about it? No, of course not. Absolutely not, because it's not revealed. So I I could speculate, but yeah. You know, but but as long as I'm saying, look, I don't know the real answer to this question, but it seems to me this might be the case. It could be the case. Yeah. Um, if I find out I'm wrong later, okay, I was wrong. Big deal. You know what I mean? So yeah. what? <laughs> uh, he says, there will be a social hierarchy of government, but there's no indication of a relational hierarchy. In other words, the Apostle Paul will be in a position of greater leadership than most of us, but that doesn't mean he'll be inaccessible. There will be no pride, envy, boasting, or anything sin-related. Our differences will be a manifestation of God's creativity. Uh, as we're uh, different in race, nationality, gender, personality, gifting, and passions, so we'll be different in positions of service. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he will, uh, he, throughout this, he cites scriptures that, um, that he's basing all these uh, theories or conclusions on. Um, but uh, 
a lot of people that they who don't study the scriptures and study heaven and they, they just think that in, in, there's like some kind of like communistic state in eternity that and, and there's just total equality that everybody is is equal in uh, but we know that uh, it talks about uh, some people are going to govern over ten cities, some people govern over five, some over mm -hmm. one. Who are they governing? There's got to be people in those cities that are being governed uh, and, and some people get uh, 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 you know they're uh, they're given uh, uh, more. You get more crowns. Uh, crowns are symbolic of, of being in, in uh, uh, having a a kingdom or a, a rule ruling authority. Right, position um, authority. Some people get you were building up treasures. Obviously, not everybody's going to have the same amount of treasures. Not everyone's going to have the same rewards at the at the judgment seat of Christ, where they get the gold, silver, and the precious. Uh, gems. Uh, over and over again, there's examples of inequality, and yet people, most people who haven't studied this, they automatically assume that everybody in heaven is just like totally equal, and uh, 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 everybody who is in heaven is equally in their salvation. Mm -hmm. They have eternal life. They don't go to, to hell. They go to heaven uh, because mm -hmm. they put their faith in the Savior, uh, and that's a free gift. But then once they did after did but once they got saved, what they did from that moment until their death determines their status and their position in, in, in eternity, their rewards, their crowns, and so on. And and it's a it's a merit system. The, that part of it is a merit system. But right. salvation right. is not a merit system. It's right, gift. exactly. Exactly. And people need to need to differentiate between the two. All, all of us will have some responsibility in which we serve God. Scripture teaches that our service for him now on earth will be evaluated to help determine how we'll serve him on the new earth. The humble servant will be put in charge of much, whereas the one who lords it over others in the present world will have power taken away. He's, quote, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Unquote. That's Luke chapter 14. Yeah, it's funny, you know. I wonder if some of these people who go around saying, "I don't want to rule," they're going to find that they're going to be in charge of a lot of stuff <laughs> because 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 they don't want to rule. And God's going to say, "That's exactly why I want you to be the one to be in charge of all these things because you didn't want it, you didn't desire it, you didn't hunger for the rule." You didn't feel that way, and that's why you're going to be the one who's in charge of a lot. Yeah. Um, I find myself, and I'm not trying to do that. I find, you know, I, I tend to, you know, I'm constantly evaluating myself. You know, I look at myself, and I look at the failings I have as a Christian, you know, and the things that I do wrong. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I look at myself and say, I can't see God putting me in charge of a lot of things. I just don't see it. <laughs> I just, I just, you know, because I look at my life, I look at what I'm in charge of now, and I say, I don't, I don't see myself being in charge of a whole lot, you know. But you never know. Maybe that's why he's may have me in charge of a lot, or or I won't be in charge of a lot. I mean, it for me either way to be in his presence is going to be enough. But but you know, but um, it's just one of those things, food for thought. It's when you say that, you know, it's you know, I I think as a Christian, what you what you think you want and what you actually do want are seldom the same thing. And God has a funny way of revealing that to you. Um, he does that all through Scripture. Um, you know, people think they want something, but when they find out they get something different, they find out that's what they wanted all along. And um, God's just the way he works. <laughs> There's really something about this verse that kind of really tickles me. It says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is it wrong that I'm really excited about those uh, prideful people being humbled? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I think because it's it's justice. It's, you know, we... we, we it, it's like... Um, I'm glad you said that. That's a real great point you make because it's like people assume that when you're angry about something that it's always bad and that's not true either. There's a certain there's such a thing as righteous anger. You know, um when you see, you know, we talk about things that are that are just terrible like abortion and we become angry about these things. You know, there, that's a righteous anger. You know, here we see an innocent with no ability to defend themselves and 
we yearn for justice because of that. You know, we yearn, like you say, you, you yearn to see the prideful put in their place because that's righteous. It's just. It's, you know, to see the prideful put where they belong. Not because we've decided that, but God says, hey, this is God's word that says pride goeth before destruction. I didn't say that. God did. So if he feels that's the case, then it's justified. And for us to see justice um, equally, and you could go this way too, you could say, is it wrong for us to... Is it wrong for us to celebrate the destruction of the wicked? And that's a tough question to answer. That's a tough question to answer because God wants us to love everyone. And, and by loving everyone, you know, I, I always I say this to people, you know, it's like I love everyone because God expects me to. Um, I'm not better than God, and God loved the whole world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And if God loves the whole world that much, then I have to love the world that much, to want them to be saved. And that's what I – I don't like them sometimes. <laughs> it's like I tell people all the time. I tell people, I say, I love everybody. I don't like some of you, but I, but I love all of you. <laughs> um, it's just that you know, when we hear about we, – we hear about those in heaven rejoicing when they see the wrath of God coming upon an unbelieving world. So – is it wrong to celebrate God's righteous judgment? No, it's not, it, 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 because it's justice and it's righteousness in its purest form. He's the one delivering it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I've spoken about this many times in, in uh, my videos about the self-righteousness, the, the spiritual pride of people, uh, and, and I've, I've made the case that uh, Jesus was was always so um, kind and merciful and loving to sinners, to tax collectors, to to prostitutes, to uh, all kinds of people, uh, except one class of people, and that's the very religious, self righteous uh, people full of spiritual pride who wanted to point the finger at other people. Those are the people he called hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, dead man's bones snakes and vipers. Uh, he dis, he really does not like self-righteousness. He likes humility. And where there's all kinds of verses that, that condemn pride and and exalt humility. So uh, I've uh, I just really this verse is gives me something to get excited about as far as I, I really think that uh, when the prideful get their just desserts and even I'm talking about some people have pride and but they're they're saved. But they're still full of pride, uh, and some people have have pride, and they're not saved because they never put their faith in the Savior. They only put their faith in their own ability, you know, right. how good they are. Right. Uh, but uh, but those people who uh, are so prideful, they never trust the Savior. They're going to get their deserve their destruction. And those people who put their faith in the Savior, but and yet had all retained all kinds of spiritual pride uh, they're going to get their what they deserve in terms of what this verse talks about being humbled right I had someone accuse me of, of false humility one time years ago and all it also it does make you kind of uh, in, in um, introspect and say, is it could it be true? I've I've had people uh, over the years uh, uh, um, accuse me of, of, of things, whether it's in biblical and Christian or it's just in the world and in my life. Uh, and 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 what I've tried to do is is um, consider could their accusation be correct? Uh, and uh, I, I, if it's correct, I I, I want to be corrected. I want to be able to uh, change if it, if it's a, if it's a correct um, accusation. Uh, and uh, I do think that I do have humility, and yet when I say that, it sounds prideful. And then other <laughs> people, and then and then other people would 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 say that well, he's just pretending to be humble. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All I can well, I say think, is I think um, I, I look at it this way. Um, I think it's very dangerous anytime anyone claims to have knowledge of what you have in your heart. And I think more Christians as well as unbelievers ought to consider that more when they make comments. 
we don't know people's hearts. God knows their hearts. So that's for him to determine whether they really are being... You know, I, I find in those cases where if somebody says, well, you're only faking humility or something like that, if I feel really offended or taken back by it, by it it's those moments where I kind of go, maybe I'd better reevaluate. You know, maybe I am being you know, falsely humble. Um, it's usually the moments where I, I know that I'm having a humility God wants me to have, where I can with confidence inside say to myself, okay, well, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. You know? yeah. And I, I, I know God knows my heart, and I'm comfortable with the level of humility I'm trying to display. We as human beings, first off, we as human beings are not humble by our nature. We, we try to be humble. We try to show some level of humility because that's what God would like us to do. It's pleasing to him. But as hard as we try, as hard as we, try we really are not ultimately humble we we try to be, um, we attempt to be, and we want to do this for God's yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we can want to be, we can pray to be, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we can't, we cannot be it by our own will. We either are or we're not. Right. And, right. And, uh, 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 I remember once years ago, uh, I was badly offended by someone, uh, and and. Someone else was discussing this with me and said, "said Luke, you're so offended by this, but do you know that a dead man cannot be offended?" And uh, I, I did. There wasn't an exact scripture, I think, as a quote, but I think the the point in scripture is that would be the case. Uh, and, and that showed me that wait a second, I'm not really so dead to myself. My my ego, my um, you know, uh, I shouldn't let these things bother me and that's proof that I still have some growing so a lot of growing to do you know some mature spiritual maturity that needs to be uh, happening I, I think and, and also another side of that is I think true humility for us happens in those moments where the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing I think that's us at our most truly humble when we do those things that nobody knows about except us and God Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in those moments when you do those, you do something and nobody has any clue that you did that, and they never know. And it's it's it, you just kind of wink at God and say, "That's between me and you, Lord." You know, um, mm -hmm. those are those moments of of true humility in us that we can only share between Him and us. Um, I think any time you're doing something expressed, I guess it could always be in question. But those moments where you do it, and like I said, where Scripture says, let the left hand not know what the right hand's doing, I think that's real true humility when you do those things. I think that's where it's at. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I forgot where I was. Um, oh, yeah, I just read Luke 14.11. Right. Uh, if we serve faithfully uh, on the present earth, God will give us permanent management positions on the new earth. Quote, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Luke 16.10. Uh, the owner has his eye on us. If we prove faithful, he'll be pleased to entrust more to us. We've been conditioned to associate governing with self-promoting arrogance, corruption, inequality, and in inefficiency. But these are perversions, not inherent properties of leadership. Ruling involves responsibility. Perhaps that's why some people don't look forward to it. <laughs> some people live in anticipation of retirement when responsibilities will be removed. Why would they want to take on an internal task of governing? <laughs> but what they think they want now and what they'll actually want as resurrected beings with strong bodies and minds in a society untouched by sin may be quite different. Wow, there's a lot to consider there, huh? Absolutely. There's a, a lot in that. Yes. Yeah. And that kind of rings true with me because I, I really am enjoying my retirement years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it rings true with me because I got I got to confess I share a little bit with the individual that said, "Man, I don't want to rule anything. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to be in charge." You know, um, you know I I got to be careful saying that. Maybe I'm going to be find out I'm going to be one of those people that's in charge of a whole lot of stuff. And yeah. <laughs> but like but, you said, you know, it's so funny he said it because didn't we just say this? He said, you know, which you think you want, which you actually wind up wanting once you're perfected, maybe two entirely different things. You may find it something different. 
Yeah. Yes. The, uh, our desires, some of the things that we really desire now, maybe we won't desire them. We'll have new desires and totally new attitude about a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, all I know is that, you know, right now, uh, oftentimes I'm quite tired. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, almost constantly, I'm hurting. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and as he says, when if when I have this glorified body that's not tired, not hurting, and my mind is perfectly clear, and I'm full of enthusiasm, maybe I'll be anxious. Lord, Lord, what else do you want me to do now? I, I finished that task. Are you pleased? You said, Can I do something else? <laughs> And, and you know, you know, you're right. There's truth to that because I, I know, and I'm starting to get there too. Where you know, things are starting to hurt me, and and uh, I'm tired a lot. I'm fatigued. I got so many things that are going against me in this in this life because of sin and because of things that go on. And but you know, you say that, and it's so funny you did that because you know, I hearken back to some of those days where I remember, man, I was on my A game. I felt I felt great. I was working out. I was, you know, I was. I, I'd go to work and was like, all right, I got to get this stuff done, and I was like, and I was, and I felt better, and that's on so much of a smaller scale than what we're going to feel like when we're in heaven. You know, we're going to feel, I mean, amazing in heaven. It's going to be something. It's like it's, it's going to be something we can't, we, we just we we can't feel it right now. We we can't understand how that's going to feel because we've never felt like that. Um, if you imagine yourself at your best when you were most active and most ready to go and most it's going to be just a hundred times that it's going to be it's going to be very different so i think your comment is, rings very true which is you know you're going to find your desires are going to change because of how different you feel mm -hmm. yeah um, imagine responsibility service and leadership that's pure joy the responsibility that God will entrust to us a as a reward uh, can only be good for us uh, and we'll find delight in it to rule on the new earth will be to enable equip and guide offering wisdom and encouragement to those under our authority we've so often seen leadership twisted that we've lost a biblical view of what ruling or exercising dominion really means. God, ruler of the universe, is living proof that ruling can and should be good. That's a great point, and that's something that Satan has masterfully done. Um, you know, we should never underestimate the enemy. It's something is you know he's been doing this for a long, long time, and um, something Christians tend to do is. You know, they underestimate him and his capability. He's done something that has – I mean, you talk to most people these days. I don't think you will ever come across a person who will ever tell you that they think that the ruling people in their government are absolutely wonderful people. <laughs> I mean, they just – nobody – because because we, we've been you – know, we've seen so much corruption and lies and deception. It's it's happened at such a rate where people have absolutely no faith in their leadership anymore. They, they don't have – you know, we've been shown how fallible they all are, you know, and it's hard to get behind something like that. You tend to look at that and see that, and you tend to associate leadership in general with that. Yeah. Yeah, we, there's a saying that uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, and that has been the case throughout history, and even today, there's uh, if we look at our, our government and what's happening in the world today, you can see that uh, you know everything is so corrupt. It, it is really sickening. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we'll, in eternity, we will have positions of authority and power, but there will be no corruption, and and it it will be uh, I'm sure will be really enthusiastic. To, mm -hmm. to exercise that uh, those responsibilities. Some people have a deep fear of public speaking, and they imagine that ruling means they'll be miserable having to be upfront and speak to groups. But the fear, anxiety, dread, and turmoil we associate with certain activities on the present earth will be gone on the new earth. If God wants us to do something, we'll be wired and equipped to do it. Our service will not only bring him glory,
but also bring us joy. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. Uh, I think that uh, I, I think I read once that uh, the number one fear, and, and I don't know if it's worldwide, but at least in America, the number one fear people have is is uh, speaking in public. Yeah, I've heard that too. Uh, uh, I've done public speaking, you know, uh, like thousands and thousands of times. I've spoken to audiences even before I started uh, uh, doing evangelism. Uh, years before that, that was my profession. I, would, I did public speaking, and it's uh, it, it, even with all that experience, I don't recall ever once ever getting up in front of an audience where I wasn't like in fear in the beginning. I, even though I've done this, made the same speech a hundred times, I know that I can do it, and yet as I'm walking up there and about to speak, fear is over, overcoming me. And, and but, but I know from experience that once I speak, the fear goes away. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so it, that's an interesting thing that uh, he uses that as an example. But uh, yeah, we're whatever the whatever the job. That, uh, that God has for each individual, uh, we will be able to do it because God's not going to give us something we're not equipped to do. That's right. <laughs> uh, this applies to countless other questions about heaven, such as, will we have to sing <laughs> even if we don't like to? <laughs> <laughs> the question assumes facts not in evidence, that whatever we dislike now, we'll dislike then. But doesn't experience tell us otherwise? Aren't there foods we love now that we hated as children? Aren't there books we love now that we that would have bored us when we were younger? Had we been able to decide as children everything we would do or not do as adults, wouldn't we have robbed ourselves of countless joys? Uh, we mustn't assume that everything we don't like doing now we still won't like doing in heaven. <laughs> Boy, it's a really, really a lot of insights there, huh? It really is. It's funny. I find myself saying that all the time. That's one of my favorite things. Um, I find my, myself saying that to my son all the time. You know, oh, your tastes are going to change. You know, um, I, I hated onions when I was younger. I hated broccoli when I was younger. I, I hated all these, but now I love that stuff. Now it's the, I you know, love it. So it's, there, there's a great, um, there's a great analogy there. That's a, that's a really good point he makes, I think. It's, it, it's wrong for us to assume what our desires are going to be like when we're perfected it, it, because it's, it'll be so different. <laughs> yeah. Looks like Brother Mike has joined us. Hello. Brother. Hey, Mike. How How's you doing, brother? Not too bad. Nice to see you. I'm glad you could make it. Better late than never. Yes, yeah, better better late than not at all. <laughs> um, uh, here's here's an interesting thing we we've just been uh, asking ourselves. You know, certain things that we don't like to do now, uh, like certain foods we don't like, or 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 maybe singing. You know, some people don't like to sing. Uh, should we assume that in in eternity on the new earth that that we're going to have the same uh, likes and dislikes and same abilities? Uh, for example. I cannot sing at all. My my entire family, except my son is is musically talented, but everybody else in my family is uh, basically tone deaf, and, and, and we're horrible. I've had people in in a, in a small church I used to go to. They asked me to not sing. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Uh, and then I said, oh, I just started clapping instead to the music, and they asked me not to clap because I couldn't even clap to the right beat. And uh, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, they said, you can go into art or chorus. So I wanted to be in the chorus because I, I just really wanted to, be, to, wanted to sing. And I was the only one that went into chorus that was forced to transfer to art <laughs> because I couldn't sing. <laughs> but but in, in eternity, the, the, the fact that, and then there's some people who don't like to sing. But if you don't like to sing or you're not able to sing, should we think that, well, I'm not going to be doing any singing in heaven? Or maybe that God's going to bless me with the ability to sing and the joy of, of singing and, and other things like that. Hmm. I, I think, I, I mean, I guess I wouldn't 
object that our likes and dislikes could be changed. I mean, we'll have a glorified body, so why wouldn't you have a glorified voice? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I mean, of, of all talents and abilities that, that I could have if I could, like, have my prayer answered, it would be that I could sing up beautifully. And uh, I'm, just, I'm like one of those people that, that tries out for American Idol that everybody laughs at. <laughs> except, except I'm not deluded. I do understand how horrible I am. <laughs> you just got to tell them what I tell people. I say, well, I'm make, the Bible says make a joyful noise. That's what I'm doing. I'm making a joyful noise. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm, make, I'm making melody of the Lord in my own heart. <laughs> right, exactly. Your, your, your ears don't have to like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the new earth, we'll do what we want, but we'll want what God wants. And that will bring us our greatest joy. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, thinking about in eternity, how our desires will... Uh, conform to God's desires for us, uh, but I've actually said that in my current state uh, to people uh, that uh, I didn't. Uh, um, obviously, I'm not professing that uh, this this uh, doctrine of sinless perfection that uh, I, I never sin anymore, because uh, I, I believe that's a false teaching. Uh, no one, uh, after they get saved, is able to go from that point on with never having any bad thoughts or bad acts. So I, I'm no exception to that. Uh, and yet, uh, what I do believe, though, is that um, through no part of my own, the Holy Spirit has transformed m my desires. And some of the things that I had strong desires for before, those desires were taken away from me. Uh, and uh, right. I've given new desires, new like what I'm doing right now. Here we are talking about Jesus, talking about heaven, talking about the scriptures, and, and that, that is probably my greatest pleasure in life now, whereas he, he said books that you, uh, early he was talking about books that you found not interesting, subjects that were not interesting, now are, in eternity you'll, you'll have an interest in them. That's already been the case for me already in this life, where my desires have totally been, been changed by the Holy Spirit, not because I tried to do it or, or some uh, legalistic attitude that I must change, but it just, the Holy Spirit did its work and, and changed my desires in many ways. Have you seen that happen in your life? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a great point, Luke. That's absolutely true. And, and so I, I think that right there is a testament to the fact that we are going to see that. We already see changes in what we desire. I mean, for me... Uh, you know, speaking in front of other people and things like that. Um, you know, before I was saved, I was always kind of a loner. I kind of like did my own thing. I didn't really, I didn't really want to go make a lot of friends. I didn't want to, you know, I was happy with the little bit of friends I had, and that was it. You know, when I became saved, I started making a lot more friends. I started um, becoming very personable with other people. You know, because because I wanted to share. You know, my faith, I wanted to share, you know, if not if not a direct witness with them, I wanted to share with them the, what the Lord had done in my life, you know, just by displaying an, a, be, a better person to them. So, yeah, I, absolutely you do. You already find, even in your sinful life, you even you already find that your, your desires have changed. So I think that's a, that's a great point. That's, I, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, one mistake that uh, is very common, though, we see, is that th this kind of uh, transformation? We can all, we can probably all uh, uh, cite uh, areas where we've we've changed. And I, I don't want to even phrase it that way because I don't want to say we've changed, but the Holy Spirit has changed us. Right. Um, uh, we can cite various ways in which the Holy Spirit has done its its transforming work on, on us. Uh, and yet, there are some people that are saying, will say that uh, if a person does not have this uh, clear changes in their life, then that's a sign that they're not saved. Um, and that, obviously, what's the mistake in that? What, what is obviously uh, it's a false, false teaching. Right. How how would you uh, des describe that that problem? And as you see it today in the um, among us. Among, well, that, among that, the Christian community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mike. Lordship salvation. Yeah. 
it's this idea that once we're saved, somehow we're now perfect and we're not supposed to be sinning anymore. Um, and so when a person does, uh, the natural reaction from those people is to assume, oh, that a person's not saved because they've committed a sin or they've done a sin. Um, I keep encountering that more, more and more, and all that has ever does is it makes it makes people um, doubt their faith. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of it has to do with an over exaggeration of what the scriptures have to say. Because of course it says, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Mm -hmm. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But it it doesn't say. You know, you're you're just gonna stop sinning all these sins. You're gonna you're gonna be, uh, you know, they they over exaggerate to the point where they're making like a, a new born again Christian a new Jesus, and that's that's false. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the uh, I made a video uh, called Easy Believism, and then a follow up to it called Carnal Christians to make the case that uh, look, every Christian is carnal. Paul wrote, when he wrote to the Corinthians, in both of his letters he was talking about how carnal they were, and yet they were Christians and they were believers, and he even said that even he was, was carnal, the Apostle Paul. So uh, every Christian is carnal. It's just a question of degrees. Mm. Right. And, and, right. And, and, and the question is, when a per person puts their faith in the Savior, uh, this uh, a lot of things happen. They receive the gift of salvation. That means they're saved from, from hell. Yeah, they receive the gift of eternal life and they're going to live forever in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells them and is sealed in them uh, and uh, will begin for the rest of their life transforming them. Now, that, that Holy Spirit in them uh, wants to do a work of changing them uh, and, and yet they still have the flesh, the old nature, and so there's a struggle going on. Mm -hmm. From the time they get saved until they take their last breath, there's a uh, conflict. And the old nature uh, against the, the new nature, the, uh, the old man or the new man, Paul calls it. And now what happens is uh, some people hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit and, and try to listen to it and, and uh, 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 comply and, and embrace it, embrace the promptings of the Spirit, and, and that, those are the people you see the transformation because they're not resisting it. Other people resist these promptings of the Spirit and they fight against it. Mm -hmm. And eventually they, they grieve the Spirit and eventually quench the Spirit and they don't even really realize the Spirit's trying to transform them anymore. Mm -hmm. So the way that people uh, mature spiritually is, is unique mm -hmm. to every individual. Some people you see great growth in them to great heights. Some people very little or none. And, and some people you see a, a growth where it's rapid and other people it's very slow and gradual. And the people, a lot of people are making the mistake of, of thinking that everybody has to be a, a, uh, identical in this process and, and, and don't understand the individuality of this process. Yeah, I, I think it also comes from a misconception of sin. That sin is merely an act I'm committing and that's not the case. We, we all have to realize the Bible tells us we're conceived in sin. We're, we're, by the seed of my father I have sin in me. A child hasn't committed a sinful act, yet the Bible tells us that we're conceived in sin. So it, it's not just an act you commit. The act, in fact, it's not the act. It's, it's sin in you that causes you to commit these acts. And Our this is where... In nature. Yes. It, it is what... It's because you have sin that you follow through, have the thoughts, and then act out upon the thoughts and commit the acts. So... Which is why Jesus covers this when he says, if you've even if you've thought about adultery in your mind, you've committed it in your heart already. So there's even though you haven't physically committed it against your spouse, you've committed it in your heart against God. The the thought is there. So and that's a result of sin being in us as people. That's not gone from us. It's not out of us yet. Um, it will be out of us when we leave these bodies. When we leave these bodies and we're perfected, it will be. But that's why Christians, yes, they sin. There are carnal Christians, absolutely. In fact, Paul dealt with carnal Christians. He still called brothers uh, in the Scripture. So. Mm -hmm. 
I, I go so far as to say that every Christian is carnal. It's just a question of the degree of, of carnality that we have. Uh, it's like in John it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So we're all carnal to some to some extent. And and I wanted to uh, comment on the on the one part you made where where people can make changes and and. Uh, listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, but I also think that people can make changes, not fully trusting alone on Christ alone for salvation, and uh, and relying on the fact, like say, let's say they were a horrible drunk, and now they think that they haven't done any more sins anymore, and they aren't they aren't drinking anymore, and they 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 have a confession of Christ now. And they believe that because they they quit drinking, that like help merited towards that salvation. If they wouldn't have quit drinking, they wouldn't have been saved. So so in their heart, they aren't trusting that Jesus Christ alone wasn't good enough. I guess it, it's different from working from your sal salvation compared to working for it, which I believe there's a lot of professing Christians today who are not really saved, who are working for salvation, that feel if they like slip up or mess up at one, you know, they're they're doomed to hell because they're just gonna, and that and that no backslidden slidden Christian could possibly be saved. I, I hope I'm not embarrassing you for clapping for that. I, I think it's a, such an important distinction, working uh, from your salvation or for for your salvation. I, yeah. I hope anybody who's watching this understood that distinction there. I think uh, I think uh, what's important about Mike's point too is that's also why it's important that the nature of the beginning of your question, Luke, is why we should not judge a person's salvation based upon what they're doing. Just because a person's doing the things that look like they're doing all the right things doesn't mean they've accepted Christ as their Savior and trusted Him completely. Just because a person is sinning doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means that they're falling to their to the nature that's still in their flesh. So this is why it's important not to judge jump to a judgmental decision of trying to attempt to know what you know is in a person's heart, which you don't. Yeah. Uh, some of the most outwardly religious people uh, that I've encountered uh, are not saved based upon their, their uh, confession of faith. I, I, I ask them on what grounds are they saved, and they're, they're basing it on what they've done. What mm -hmm. they've done is what Jesus did. Right. And, and, yet, and yet, if we're going to judge their salvation based upon how they're conducting their lives, outwardly, they, well, they seem very, very good citizens, you know, right. very, doing a lot of good things. So mm -hmm. uh, that's why I disagree with that point about, uh, in the book of James, how people draw this distinction that uh, uh, the idea of being justified in the sight of God versus justified in the sight of man. I think the justification is the same. I have to wait. I don't know if you realize how loud that is. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> you crumpling that is like a, it sounds like an earthquake going on. <laughs> <laughs> it was. That was loud. <laughs> that must have been, uh, right, been right in the microphone. So the uh, people want to make it seem like um, justified in the sight of God by your faith. But you're justified in the sight of man by your works because man can't see your faith; he can only see your works. But I think that's a lie. I, 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 to me, nobody is justified in my sight by their works because the works deceive us. You, I, you know, if I was going to look at all the Mormons of the world, I'd say, oh, they're all justified because they're out there being real religious and good citizens and doing all kinds of good stuff and trying not to sin. Uh, but and yet, they're uh, no, they're not justified by their works in my sight. I, they're justified if they answer my question correctly. Exactly. Why, why should God let you into heaven? Exactly. If they say, well, I'm a good Mormon. I do all kinds of good stuff. I say, no, you're not justified then. And I'll go a step further. And Christians don't do this. So it's not solely upon Christians who do this. I debate uh, unbelievers quite frequently, and and they and they hit this point all the time. Well, if there is a God, I'll you know I'll just do the best I can and. And uh, that'll be that, and in the end, I'll find out. And then you're, and you'll find out you're going to hell because your good works are as filthy rags to God. And, and they try to twist that point as just recently that that we don't uh, that free grace believers don't promote 
good works. No, I'm all for doing good works, but doing good works in regards to salvation don't help at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, uh, Randy's next question is, who, whose idea is our rulership? Uh, many people have told me that they're uncomfortable with the idea that mankind will rule the earth, govern cities, and reign forever. It sounds presumptuous and self-important. I would agree if it was our idea to reign over the universe. It would indeed be presumptuous, but it was not our idea. It was God's, and it's not a minor or peripheral doctrine. It's at the very heart of Scripture. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it gets back to that point we've talked about several times now is this, this pious attitude of people acting like, well, I, don't, I wouldn't want to rule, I let God rule, uh, I don't need a mansion in heaven, I'll just settle for a shack, or, or however they want to act like they're being very humble and pious, uh, and yet this is not a man's idea uh, in, in, the, in the scriptures, it's, it's, God, it's God's plan for us to be co-heirs and co-reign. A reader of one of my previous books sent a letter expressing amazement at something I said. Quote, you take the stewardship parables literally, unquote. Uh, he wrote, uh, you actually think some believers will rule over cities in heaven? <laughs> yes, I do, though I never would have come up with this understanding on my own. But because dozens of passages affirm that we will rule the earth, I am compelled to believe them. The man who wrote the letter has read the same scriptures, but he doesn't connect them with the teachings about our bodily resurrection, the new earth, and reigning with Christ. If he did, he'd see that uh, largely, uh, though not exclusively, literal understanding of the stewardship parables, which re refer to our reigning over cities, cities, fits perfectly with the teaching of countless other passages. The fact it doesn't conform to his own view of heaven suggests his view is in need of revision. As I've studied the subject of heaven, I've often had to revise my own viewpoint to bring it in line with what the Bible teaches. Yeah, it's, uh, again, uh, this person's, uh, it's another example of this person uh, uh, being the type of person that acts like uh, this, uh, this Maybe it's humility, maybe it's false humility, uh, but uh, acting like, no, I, we, we shouldn't be reigning. It's God's position to reign, and yet the scriptures tell us, no, we're supposed to reign with God. It, it's his plan. I, I, I know you probably agree that uh, as we've been studying this, maybe you already had much of this knowledge before this. we studied heaven, but I know that uh, uh, my viewpoint of heaven in eternity, before I studied heaven, uh, it was totally different from the way I, I saw it. I, I didn't really see these parables about, you know, uh, ruling over ten cities, for example. I didn't really understand them or really uh, uh, relate to them. I, I just kind of, there's a lot of things in the scriptures where I read and I said, well, I don't really understand it, but instead of trying to understand it, I just went on and said, I'll come back to that later. And years later, go, years go by, and I never went back to try to really figure it out. Uh, and yet, when we, when we study them out in context of heaven, then, then it, you can see that these, these are to be taken literally. And you, I think you'd agree with that now. Yeah, actually, I had, um, I don't know about Mike, but I, I had a, a, the exact opposite situation. Um, I already believed these things. There were a few things that he put in the book that I kind of went, wow, I never thought of that before that way. But for the most part, I already believed this from my study of Scripture in my life as a Christian. I already believed these things. That's what drew me to the book. I was looking for books about heaven, and I was able to go on Amazon, and anybody who's been on there, so you can look at a book, and it'll have like little passages from the books that you can kind of read a little sample of what's in the book. And I found so few that actually agreed with what I thought I learned from Scripture. And then I came across Randy's book, and I thought, wow, I thought the same thing. I think the same thing. It's like I can't believe this guy's right. And then that actually, the book was really a reaffirmation of what I already believed based on what of my studies of Scriptures have been. 
Mm-hmm. So I've, I found that that was actually what I believed already. I, this just was a, a, a reaffirmation that other people out there, other Christians out there, do agree with this with this mindset and do see this in Scripture as being the case. Yeah. I'd what's say... Been, um, I was going to ask Mike, what's been your experience on this? I'd say I, I believe a lot of it because exactly that's what the Scriptures have said. And so, some things are new, but like Eric, a lot of the things aren't aren't uh, shockingly new. It just I struggle, I guess... Uh, because I obviously I, I accept my faith that it's going to be that way. I just struggle at man, is he is he really going to, you know, give us that full, you know, sub authority? I mean, that's it's I guess that that's the shocker that comes into it. Is, is God really going to you know, a city? I mean, I, I can I can barely you know manage <laughs> my room. I mean, yeah. Well, well I, I think we need to understand also that, that, that it is just, this will work because he's going to enhance our abilities. Uh, we will right. be, he's not going to give us a job or a position to do that we're not able to do. Exactly. And I think part of that uh, is going to be determined by how much we grow from the time we get born again till the time we die. Uh, this this part of our life is important so that we are bec- building up our resume and becoming qualified so that he will uh, uh, you know decide how we fit into this uh, eternal plan. How's your resume looking? There's still some things I want to add. <laughs> <laughs> we must learn to take scripture seriously when it speaks of our reigning over the earth. By telling ourselves that we mustn't interpret Scripture literally, often we end up rejecting its plain meaning. Our assumptions generally dictate our interpretations. If we imagine, for example, that the eternal heaven is disembodied and unearthly, then concepts about of government, culture, social structures, and delegated tasks will naturally strike us as naive, if not bizarre. But if we understand the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead and the reality of the new earth, these concepts make perfect sense. Yeah. Well, it's unfortunate, though, that uh, I probably, I'd say 90% of Christianity uh, doesn't see it in that context. Um, others may perceive that the new earth will need to, no government or that differing levels of authority such as ruling over ten cities while others rule over five or one or none are inherently corrupt or unfair. But the need for government didn't come about as a result of sin. God governed the universe before Satan fell. Likewise, he created mankind as his image bearers with the capacity for ruling. And before Adam and Eve sinned, God specifically commanded them to rule the earth. Ruling isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. God has called us to it and and has equipped us for it to rule the earth, rule it well, and find pleasure in ruling it. Because we're sinners, power tends to corrupt us. But on the new earth, there will be no sin. Therefore, all ruling will be just and benevolent, devoid of abuse, corruption, or lust for power. Hmm. That's exciting. Uh... And that's, I think, one of people's chief problems. One of the people's chief problems is they can't disassociate the world and its sin nature from without it. They have trouble envisioning that these things in a, in a perfected state, hierarchy in a perfected state. They really have trouble with that. Mm-hmm. They tend to always associate, the, associate that with something bad. And so they naturally do that. And so in heaven, it must not be there because I naturally associate this with something bad because that's all I've experienced in life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you're right. We don't have any experience with a uh, perfect, uh, without, without the sin nature, without the corrupted world. No. We don't have any experience of that. It's hard for us to even, uh, you know, comprehend it. Like so much <laughs> of creation and eternity, we right. can't comprehend it. But we don't understand it. We can't imagine it. Uh, um, uh, the video I mentioned that I watched yesterday uh, that a brother made about heaven, uh, he made the point that uh, we can't even begin to imagine it. And I think that's that's not the case. I think we can imagine it. Mm-hmm. We can't necessarily comprehend it. Uh, we'll never comprehend it uh, com- completely, even in eternity. There'll be so much that we can't comprehend. 
and, and yet our imagination is certainly able to, uh, looking at the scriptures and imagining how it will be, I, it, we, we can use our imagination, and the scriptures do tell us quite a bit about it. Yeah. Uh, some Christians err by demeaning and ignoring politics, thereby failing to exercise their God-given stewardship. Others put too much confidence in politics, failing to understand God's insistence that he alone will establish a perfect government on earth. When, we, when have we ever experienced the peace on earth promised at Christ's birth? We haven't yet, but we will. Uh, meanwhile, God calls us to cultural reform and development. Christians should be involved in the political process and we can do much good, but we should never forget that the only government that will succeed in global reform is Christ's government. Yeah, we uh, we, we were discussing that earlier, that the uh, all the governments throughout history have failed. I mean, you know, you know, they've been uh, only successful to a certain extent and, and flawed, and only when uh, we have uh, the King of Kings. Uh, uh, in charge, then our, that kind of theocracy uh, will will it, a, a government actually work? I don't know about being involved in government. I don't know. I I do vote. I mean, there are some people that totally have withdrawn and they don't even want to vote. Uh, and then some Christians really want to get involved and run for office and be really involved. And I I don't have much of a taste for it because I, I it just as I see the government. What's going on in our government today is, is just it's it's just sickening to me. I, I don't have any desire or will to participate other than voting. I, I probably have some out there theories on that. So out, <laughs> no out there theories? <laughs> what are, can you concisely express them? I I I don't really believe we have a voice. That's how I'd sum it up. I and I understand I understand both sides of the equation, and both points are understandable. You feel that way, and um, to some degree, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. Um, it seems like, as far as like Luke's saying, I understand too. You know, you feel like in some way, if you're if you're getting involved with government these days, in some way, you have to compromise who you are. Um, you couldn't be a, a quintessential politician and really live by the principles that you are as a as a born again believer in Christ. It's it's hard to do that without compromising something somewhere. And that's where Christians have a hard time with that, and I think it's where Luke says that, and I agree with him. On it. I just wouldn't want to be involved in it. I understand Mike's take on that. I've heard people say the same thing, um, that they don't want to vote because they just feel that it's pointless because their voice means nothing because um, it's not really counting for everything, anything because either they feel that um, there's too much – Either there's too much immorality in the world for you to counter with your vote or that the vote's fixed and it doesn't matter what you say anyway because the people who they want to get in are the people that are going to get in. And that might kind of be what Mike's saying. He might feel that way too. And that very well may be the case. I don't know. I, 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 you know, I mean, there's, you see strange things happen in voting, and, and um, I think the important thing, and someone said this to me once, and I think it's important. The important thing is... is um, what you do in the sight of God in your heart, whether you feel your vote doesn't count or not, are you still taking a step forward to say, well, I'm still going to treat it as if it does? You know, in the eyes of God, I've made my vote, I've cast my ballot, I've I've spoken from my heart. If this person is who they say they are, you know, I can't control if they're lying. You know, if they are, I'll find out. But I'm taking at face value what the person's saying, and I'm going by this is the better of the candidates, some people have a problem picking the lesser of evils, and they see that as the decision right. that it's a lesser of evils. And I I understand that philosophy. And to, in that case, I would say I don't think there's any easy answer to that question. I think it's something you have to. I used to feel that way too when I was younger, but to me it became a thing where when I went to the ballot box. I was doing it on behalf of my heart before God. It wasn't something I was doing for men. It wasn't something I was doing thinking I was going to maybe even make a difference. But in my heart, if I were to answer to God, I would say, look, as a steward, I picked, I cast a vote. I'm told that this vote matters in my country. And so I'm casting a ballot. This is my voice being heard. If it's not heard, that's not my fault. I did what I could. And that's the way I see it. And, and I, I, I battle not... Uh 
uh, compromising we speak, I guess, on what Scripture has to say, because Scripture does say, you know, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and so there's there's obviously promises of God that uh, I believe decisions can be changed, and you know, hearts can be softened, and e even if you don't necessarily like the scenario, it doesn't mean it's totally out of, you know, our power. I mean, even if you feel powerless as a Christian, we have we have been you know, given the power to call upon the name of the Lord and ask on Him to, you know, inter intercede for us on our behalf. So, no, that's a great point. I think you're right. I, th I think we, we, we can't sell short the fact that God does change hearts. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you pray for your leaders, you pray for your country, you pray for, you know, um, I think an important distinction to make is though, and he makes this in the book, I think this is kind of what Luke was saying too, was, an important thing is, though, is we as Christians, we are not politicians first. We are Christians first. And if you follow that philosophy, it doesn't matter what any candidate is saying. You go by what you think God wants you to do and who he would want you to pick based on what they're saying. Like I said, if they're lying, that's on them. That's not on you. Um, you're simply making a decision based on what you think God would want you to do. Um, we don't make decisions based on our country or even our family, or even ourselves first. We have to base our, de base our decisions on God first. Everything else comes second. Mm -hmm. You know, um, numerous times we, we've gotten into uh, discussions about eschatology, you know, the, the study of the end times. And, and uh, I think we're, the three of us are all in agreement that uh, we believe in a pre-trib rapture, a pre-millennial return, a thousand-year uh, uh, millennium, and then uh, the uh, the end, and the new, the judgment, the, the great white throne judgment, and then the eternity. the, the, the uh, new heavens and new earth and eternity. This is how we see it all playing out. And mm -hmm. I, I spent a lot of time years ago studying this a lot, and it was a fascinating subject, very interesting. And I got, but I finally reached a point years ago that I thought my mind needs to be on something else and that's just I want to focus on soteriology and that's the study of the study of the teaching of salvation because n there's nothing nothing else matters uh, food doesn't matter clothing doesn't matter government doesn't matter nothing matters if a person's not saved <laughs> you know right. so let's exactly. most first and most important of all let's tell someone how to get saved and, and then it's important to feed them and clothe them and get try to help governments and all that stuff and we'll, then we can think about end times how it's going to all play out so my priorities like shifted and, and uh, I thought, look, this book here, I've read it all. I've read it from beginning to end. So see, I know the end of the story. I know how it ends. And I know that I know that uh, thinking that somehow we're going to change the governments and change the world and solve the problems, that that is futile, that it is, it is a, we cannot do it because it is written. Once it's been written in here, right. then that's how it's going to play out. Yeah. So uh, for me to try to get involved in changing the world through political change and that kind of a thing is, uh, to me, is uh, uh, it's a waste of time. I don't want to do something that's going to delay the inevitable because the inevitable is beautiful. We know the end of the story right. is beauty. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, I do struggle that, hey, I love some of the things about America um, I, I love the, the freedoms we have, and I want to keep them as long as we have. I want the freedom of speech, the freedom of, of religious uh, convictions. And these things are so valuable, I don't want to see them taken away, but I can see that coming eventually. Right. Yeah. And I'd like to delay that, so at least through my lifetime, I'd like, want to keep this freedom. <laughs> hey, hey, hey there's, a, there's a couple others coming up here, so maybe a little bit past your lifetime, too, Luke. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, you're right. I shouldn't like saying, so, "Hey, I'm going to be around for a while." You know, I, I should be so self-centered. I should care that you have your freedom after I'm gone. <laughs> okay. Um, Jesus said, "Quote: I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel." That's Luke chapter 22. 
God's purpose and plan will not fully be achieved until Christ confers upon us the kingdom he has won. This will take place after our bodily resurrection when we will eat and drink at a table with the resurrected Christ on a resurrected earth. Some scholars limit this reign to the millennium, but parallel passages indicate an eternal reign. That this is an actual rule on a physical earthly kingdom, not spiritual rule in a disembodied state, is demonstrated by the references to our eating and drinking at a table with Christ. Obviously just uh, uh, a couple of many, many other uh, examples we can give to show that mm -hmm. we are going to have a physical reality, not just some sp disembodied spiritual realm of existence. Uh, looking forward to what God has for us, the Master will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your Master. Matthew chapter 25. Uh, you know, I've often felt that that's, not, that's really my greatest desire. Uh, I want to hear those words from Jesus more than anything else. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Absolutely. Amen. Uh, commenting on this passage, Dallas Willard writes, quote, that joy is, of course, the creation and, con and care of what is good in all its dim dimensions. A place in God's creative order has been reserved for each one of us from the beginnings of cosmic existence. His plan is for us to develop as apprentices to Jesus to the point where we can take our place in the ongoing creativity of the universe. The idea of entering into the Master's joy is a telling picture of heaven. It's not simply that being with the Master produces joy in us, though certainly it will. Rather, it's that our Master himself is joyful. He takes joy in himself, in his children, and in his creation. His joy is contagious. Once we're liberated from the sin that blocks us from God's joy and our own, we'll enter into his joy. Joy will be the very air we breathe. The Lord is inexhaustible. There, therefore, his joy is inexhaustible. I love the word joy. Uh, I made a, a video titled Joy, uh, and, and it's, it's called J-O-Y. And I use it as the, uh, the acronym um, Jesus, Others, and Yourself. Mm -hmm. I think this is, the, this is the, um, the priority that he wants our minds to be, to be on. Uh, G, our mind on Jesus, that's the default position. And then, uh, and then second to that should be what can we do for others? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and heart, and love uh, your neighbor as yourself. So it's it's God first, and then and then ourselves. I mean, no, then others, and then finally we we can say, well, well what about my self interest? <laughs> you know, obviously. Right. Right. And if a person can reach that state of maturity, where their their thoughts are primarily on Jesus and others, and then finally, lastly, themselves, I think they will have joy. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't reached that point in my maturity where I can say that I've accomplished that or that I've been transformed to that degree but just I do a, think that, that that is that is joy just a quick comment on joy it's actually a fruit of the spirit so um, uh, ha happiness I, I've heard it preached this way before that happiness depends on your situation and your circumstances where joy is unaffected by situation by circumstances it's it's, it's a the very uh, feeling of, of excitement, and endearment, of, uh, associated with happiness directly from God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I, I've said this several times before. Uh, uh, you know, I... I, I... Oh. I think we lost them. <laughs> He'll be back. <laughs> All these um, things that you think in life that you need to uh, try to. Uh, uh, can Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost you for a little bit there. 
Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I that a notice came up, but I'm I'm back now. Yeah, you're. Yeah, we hear you. All right. Uh, I don't remember the last thing I before I got cut off, but I'm, my uh, I've said this before that uh, uh, I'm a very happy person. Most of, most of the problems in life that I've had to deal with over my whole lifetime, I've been able to uh, uh, get my my life in a pretty good position, whether it's financial, my marriage, my relationships, and so on. So I'm, I'm basically I'm very very happy. My biggest problem really is just you know uh, you know an achy body all the time. <laughs> But but most of the time I'm very very happy and even I get giddy I get so just joy a, a joyful state and I'm very fortunate and blessed I, I I just find myself praying throughout the day thanking God for just everything even the chair that I'm sitting on uh, the things that we the things that we just always take advantage I'm finding that I'm not I'm not just taking taking them for granted now. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 realizing that every little thing, the clothes I have on, the house, the, everything. I'm just so blessed, and I'm constantly just thankful and full of joy. Uh, and so, it is. Um, uh, I forgot why why we even got into this question about joy. It was, must have been. Oh yeah, it's right here in this book, uh, talking about being. He he is our joy. Um, all right. Before I go on to this final point here, uh, what do you want to say about joy? I think that was a very good point. That uh, uh, sum that up again for us, uh, brother Mike, about what you said about joy. Uh, that joy is uh, a fruit of the spirit, directly from God, and it's unaffected by situation or circumstances. Yeah, I think that is the case. I think that's a very good. Uh, uh, um, uh, differentiation, it, differentiation between happiness and joy. Yes, and it can uh, only I found that that's the case. I think, I think, I think with, there are things that come with joy. You know, ha right. happy, right. Ha happiness can be a surface thing. Um, joy is, to me, like those moments where even in the face of something maybe terrible that you might be facing in your life, you still have that knowledge and uh, that assurance. Um, uh, that a good example. With, a good example I can give is uh, when the Christians were being persecuted by King Nero. They were thrown into the lion's den. They had no reason to be happy and praising exactly. the Lord. And they were full of rejoice and full of uh, the expectation of giving the crown of glory for, for doing so. And that would, to me, would be a perfect demonstration of joy unaffected by situation or circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I was equating it. That's a great. That's a great. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, I was I was equating it more to um, uh, you know events that happen in our life in our lives. You know, in current days, you find out you know you have an illness like with what's going on with my dad or or, or other Christians who find out in the face the face of a a possible devastating illness or some terrible news that you still manage to find that joy in the knowledge of God having your back regardless of the circumstances. The knowledge of of um of knowing his will is being done regardless that 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 there is a purpose there is meaning to these things even if they don't if you even if you don't understand them at the time which I'm sure those Christians felt the same thing they didn't understand why they were needed to face that or that they they themselves had to go through that but they took joy in knowing that there was a plan there was a purpose and God was aware of all this and and there was his knowledge in this through the whole thing and I think that's all joy that's all part of joy mm -hmm. Yeah, some of my favorite words that uh, I think of is uh, joy, uh, bliss, and ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that uh, uh, we get we get parts of that in our life now, uh, but I think in, in eternity that'll be like our, our, our normal state of existence. <laughs> um, the the I did underline one sentence here on this uh, in the end here that. I must have thought this was important or profound. It said, Christ is not simply preparing a place for us. He is preparing us for that place. And that's a good place to end here. That's the end of this chapter 21. So let's discuss that premise, and then we'll, uh, we'll end this study here. Christ is not simply preparing a place for us. He is preparing us for that place. Yes.
So can you expound on that? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Oh. Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that he is, he is actually, you know, he's changing us, he's... He's molding us into me, more in his image of, of Jesus, and he I, he's kind of like, I guess, revealing and, re re well, I guess that's not the way I want to say it. He's, he's, yeah, the first point I made, he's molding us to be more of what he would like us to be in the future. I mean, we, we won't be perfect, but he's kind of like mentally preparing us, he's physically you know, preparing us, you know, hey, you know, is as Luke mentioned, you know, you know, kinda let go of this whole the old flesh and, and the your glorified body's gonna be much better, you know, the in this a multitude of ways he's he, he's uh he's getting us ready for the best to come. Spiritually, physically, mentally. Mm -hmm. Uh to me it speaks volumes about, you know, God's grooming us for to be these good leaders, to, to, to be to, to fit these responsibilities that we're going to have. And um, this also to me speaks volumes about the fact that we are going to uh, have our personalities in eternity. We will be ourselves. We will have knowledge of what we went through. I mean, isn't that the whole point? What's the point in going through all this only to have every knowledge of it wiped away? There are things to be learned. There are things to be wisdom to be gained. Um, that can only be done through what we call uh, the school of hard knocks. You know, I mean, sometimes I joke about that at work, but sometimes the school of hard knocks is the best way to learn something. You learn more by your failures than you ever do by your successes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. I'm, I, I, I'm, I know that uh, I, I've been attending that school for a lifetime, and I still haven't graduated from it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doesn't appear to be any end in sight either for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, now, once 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 a person gets saved and they're born again, from that moment until they take their last breath, or the or we get the rapture, the resurrection, uh, we have that amount of time to um, get prepared for eternity, and, and the Holy Spirit is wants to transform us. Now, a person needs to make up their mind. How are you going to respond to the Holy Spirit that wants to transform you? Uh, I, I'm going to advise everybody to embrace the promptings of the Spirit. Listen and embrace it and let and, and submit yourself so that the Holy Spirit can do its work in transforming you. Um, the, you've got this old nature in you that wants to resist it. And, and we have a choice. We can we can try to we can purposely say, I want to embrace it. I want to hear Holy Spirit talk to me, change me, pray for that. And uh, or we can resist it and want to go on just living our lives and, and not growing and maturing at all. But the the advantage of growing and maturing is that we're becoming better prepared for eternity, so that we can have this uh, this role that that God would, is offering us. And it's nothing. There's nothing greedy or evil about wanting to to have a uh, a position in eternity, to to build up the, your treasures in heaven, to re work to receive these rewards at the be the judgment seat of Christ. There's nothing evil about that kind of um, uh, motivation. Uh, the Bible tells us that's the attitude we should have. Okay, uh, now. We talked a lot about heaven. We talked about uh, you know our roles and positions that we have uh, uh, in in eternity, uh, but we haven't talked about what a person must do so they're they're able to uh, have eternal life in this uh, new heaven and new earth. So we don't want to neglect that. Uh, I know that uh, uh, if you ask a person, uh, do you want to go to heaven? Uh, some people are going to say no. I've, I've actually been shocked that some people have answered my question, no, they don't want to go to heaven. And if they don't want to go to heaven, then there's nothing we can do to, to change their mind, I don't think. Uh, maybe, but I, what I usually tell them is, well, maybe you don't want to go to heaven now, but maybe someday you'll change your mind. Do you want, do you want to know what you must do so, so that you can have eternal life in heaven? I'll tell you, so at least if you change your mind and decide someday you do want to go to heaven, you'll know what's necessary, what's required of you. 
And, and so how, how would you answer that question, Brother Mike, if, 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 uh, if I asked, well, what is required of someone so that they can have this eternal life? What must they do? Well, I would say first they have to acknowledge that they are a sinner, that they are uh, in a state of disobedience against God, and what he has written on your heart and your conscience bears witness to that, and that the only requirement to have the, the guarantee of eternal life or everlasting life, as the Bible says, is to believe on him, to trust solely on God himself, Jesus Christ, that you know, Jesus Christ made the claim of being God, and that he, he uh, uh, that his works, his righteousness, and his sacrifice on the cross for our disobedience or our sins, uh, by the shedding of his blood, we have forgiveness of that. We have the uh, perfect uh, substitute, the only perfect substitute, I might add, for our sins in in place of us. We should be on that cross. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that uh, you want people to understand that, that every one of us are sinners, but Jesus paid for all of our sins. Correct. Okay, and brother Eric, what would you would you add anything to that? I would say that um, to add further to that is is something you have to realize, and this takes a lot for a human being because as human beings we tend to be control freaks. And the key to this is a little bit as far as what Mike said too is it realizing you never were in control. Um, your future relies solely upon what God has done for you, the work he has done for you. There's no amount you can pay. You can't build this ladder to heaven. You can't do all, earn a place by your good works and what a wonderful person you are and being good and earning that spot. It's not something you're capable of doing. Um, you have to abandon the idea that you can do this yourself or that you can... Uh, through all these different avenues, find your way to God through some other way around Jesus. He's got to be the only way. It cannot be through your own works. It cannot be through someone else. It has to be through Christ and your complete trust in Him and what He has done. That's it. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Amen. So uh, I, I think that uh, if you're watching this video now and you understand and agree that, look, nobody's perfect, we're all sinners, and the Bible says that we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And, and if you understand that you're not perfect, and, and uh, you do need to be saved. You can't do it yourself, and there is only one Savior, Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins. But the good news is that even though he died on the cross and paid for our sins, he, he raised himself from the dead. And that proves that he is God, and he does have the power over life and death. So the good news is that not only did Jesus pay for your sins, but he is offering you life everlasting on this new heaven and new earth in eternity. It's, it's offered to you as a free gift. He has it to you. He's reaching out. And he wants to give it to you right now. And all you got to do is receive it through him, uh, from him through faith. Just put your faith completely in him. In other words, Acknowledge that you are helpless, you can't do it on your own, as Brother Eric said, and, and instead of putting your faith in yourself, put your faith in Jesus. That means you're depending on him completely, and when you, put your, when you depend on him completely, he's faithful, and he gives you eternal life. Will you do it now? If so, please make a comment on the video so that we know about it. That would, just, that would give us joy. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, everybody, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you uh, for the panelists for, for uh, joining the discussion. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. And my wife has perfect timing. She's knocking on my door.